we've talked about exams and how the traditional approach to assignment evaluation or exam taking, it, it, it's sort of like this private experience where you have a, a single expert or maybe a group of experts who look at a paper or they look at the results of a test and then they give out a grade and the rest of society just sort of trust what the experts have to say and the value of your credential depends on if, if the professor who examined you was from Harvard or University of Michigan or what have you. And we've been talking about outsourcing that responsibility, outsourcing that privilege to crowdsourcing it, the yeah, crowdsourcing it to, the, to the general public and saying, all right, look, we're going to tear down the gate and we're going to say, my opinion doesn't matter, nor does this professor's opinion matter. You're the one that wants to hire this person. You're the one that wants to consider them for an opportunity. Why don't you take a look at their exam? Uh, why don't you take a look at what they wrote? No, I mean, TK, the, the amount of trust that's involved in this system is absolutely absurd. I mean, first of all, from the participant or from the student standpoint, you're trusting that this professor uh, knows their stuff and that they know better than you what kind of knowledge you should have and what kind of knowledge will be valuable to you and that they're the best ones at interpreting the way that you demonstrate your knowledge and they're the best ones at saying whether or not you have a high level of knowledge or a low level and that they do it through this grade, you know, GPA or letter grade system. And then society at large, whether it's employers looking at resumes or whomever, is trusting that the university does a good job in picking professors. The university is trusting that those professors are doing a rigorous job in putting their stamp of approval on people. And it's all based on a lot of trust of a very small number of people uh, who have gotten, you know, accreditation from some bureaucratic board that we're all trusting knows which institutions deserve accreditation and which don't. And just like in, I think the analogy of Bitcoin is really powerful. The big breakthrough is that it's a trustless payment verification system. You don't have to trust one or two financial institutions to say, don't worry, this person's good for it. They'll pay you. It's open to the world. It's peer to peer. You can look in real time and verify whether this person knows what they're talking about, whether they can pay what they say they can pay. And that's really what we're talking about, opening this up to the world. You want to demonstrate your knowledge on something valuable to you that you think is going to be valuable to employers. You want to demonstrate that you have a high level of knowledge on, let's say, marketing. Instead of just saying, I got a degree in marketing from some university that I want you to trust uh, knows their stuff from professors who I want you to trust know what's valuable about marketing to your business. You can show right there, tear the doors off this thing. Don't do it behind closed doors and come out with a piece of paper that says the secret process reveals that I'm an A student. Tear the doors off and show us. Show us that exam. The exam is an interview. It's a podcast. It's you talking about the things that you understand. Hey, let me tell you what I know about SEO, why it's important, why I think content marketing is more valuable than paid advertising. And we can all watch that. And who gets to give you the grade? society anybody who wants to anybody who watches that can say this person knows what they're talking about or not that is the breakthrough removing all this trust and centralization from the system and really democratizing it and you know when people hear you talk about trust it's easy for people to interpret this as oh this is some arbitrarily rebellious system that says down with authority and but i, I think we have to go beyond thinking about trust merely in terms of competence or character but we have to think about trust in terms of an, one entity's capacity to speak for what another entity will value. And that's just something that is extremely difficult, if not impossible, in most cases to do. So I have a story that I told you in how in fifth grade, we had a, um, the, the, the small town that we lived in, the public library had a book writing contest. And my English teacher thought it would be a good idea to combine that with an assignment. And so she had all of the students in the class pair up with one other student and they created their own story and we turned it in she gave us a grade and then she submitted the stories to the library so me and a good friend of mine his name is bill he was just an excellent illustrator we paired up and we came up with this story called charlie and the three cats it was a really cool funny story and he just drew like the most killer art to it we turned it in we got the worst grade in class we got a d on that story but then two weeks later we get a call from the library saying that we won the contest. And Bill and I ha had the chance to go to this special event where we presented our story in front of all of these parents. And we were in the school, you know, in the, um, 
in the local town paper. And we were like these mini little celebrities of Westchester for like three days. And it was the most awesome thing. Now, was our teacher incompetent? Did she lack character? Absolutely not. She was totally trustworthy in the arena of being a good person, having sincere intentions, and knowing you know, uh, the, the rules of grammar and all the things that would make a person a good English teacher. But the one thing she couldn't do was predict what the people at the library making a decision, what they were looking for, what they valued in a story, or what other parents valued in a story. And this is what's so important. You know, it's not a way of saying, hey, college professors don't know what they're talking about. It's saying, look, there's a disconnect between what your history professor says is good and what the person you're going to be, what, what the person who's making the decision at Google is going to think when you hand them your degree or when you apply for a job or so forth. And I think that's something important to touch on. And the world is going this way. You see it everywhere and we love it everywhere. Look at the publishing industry. It's, it's no longer, it's less and less the case that one or two gatekeepers say, this is a book worth publishing. It's now you can self publish. And if you blow it up on Amazon and you have tons of reviewers, anybody can review. Some people are experts, some people aren't. People get to weigh through what's more valuable to them. Expertise, and having an authority on certain things is incredibly valuable in the marketplace as determined by the marketplace, right? As determined by what's valuable and opening that process up, it, it's everywhere, it's all around us. It's from Yelp reviews to Amazon reviews to just the process of producing podcasts, for example. Who's an expert, who's an authority? I don't know, if you're in the fashion industry, who do you listen to? Who do you determine knows what they're talking about? And that's really, what it's all about. I think the, the power here is just that it's, it's so much more focused on what's valuable to the people you want to be working with. I mean, let's be honest. Most people go to college to get a credential that they think will signal people in the workforce and in the world of, of careers that this is someone worth hiring. And that credential is getting weaker and fuzzier because nobody knows what it means anymore. What does it mean that you have a degree from this place? What does it mean that you got an A in this class? Well, let me show you. Let me show you what I know. Let me demonstrate my knowledge and you decide. I mean, it's absolutely awesome. And, and not only for society at large and for maybe employers or people that want to work with you or investors, but for you, the learner. When you go on a podcast, you've done a lot of podcast interviews. Do people say, hey, come on the podcast and I'm going to test you? What do they say? How do they approach you? Oh, they typically say, hey, let's talk about a few things. And they usually have some sort of concept of what I'm already interested in or what I already know about, what, I'm, what I already have some experiences in. And they say, here are two to three topics I want to talk to you about. They let me know ahead of time. Some of them even give me a list of possible questions. They say, I'm not, I'm not going to stick to script, but here are some of the things we'll probably cover. And I, I may ask spontaneous follow-ups and so forth. And I go into the conversation with an understanding of what we're going to talk about. And it never feels like a drill. It never feels like they're testing me to see if I was telling the truth when I said I know about this topic. It seems like a genuine effort to learn from me and hear my ideas. And the topic itself, think about if someone said, TK, I want to do an interview with you on forestry. You'd probably say, I don't know anything about that. And frankly, I don't even want to be seen as somebody who knows something about that. That's not valuable to me. You might say, let's talk about uh, creativity and you know the movie industry or let's talk about education uh, new approaches to it you'd pick the things that are interesting to you that you know about or at least want to know about you might say yeah let's talk about that but I'm gonna study up first so I'm a little bit more prepared and things that you want the world to see you as knowledgeable on because it in the end of the day it's what's valuable to you what what kind of industry do you want to work in? If you don't want to work in forestry, who cares if you can go, you know, pass a test on forestry? So it puts it in the individual standpoint. I mean, here at Praxis with this idea, it's like, okay, you tell us the topics you want to talk about. If you want to show your knowledge of philosophy, let's talk about it. Let's talk about what you do know. It doesn't matter what you don't know. You can decide. It's not about going through an arbitrary list of things. Um, it's, you know, it's about demonstrating the things that you want to be to be seen as and, and the best part you can't you can't bs it you can't go on you know you listen to a podcast you can tell if someone actually knows what they're talking about or not so this process that we take during praxis praxis exams of having the participants tell us what it is they want to study ahead of time it can easily give rise to a concern that says wait a minute wait a minute if they're picking what it is they want to talk about then isn't that kind of like cheating 
aren't, aren't they going to only study the things they want to talk about? And I think it's important to, to bring up a couple of things with that. Number one, I think it puts far more pressure on them because when I'm the one who decides what they talk about, then it sort of gives them an out. If they don't know something about it, they can say, well, I wasn't prepared for that question or that happened to be the one thing that I didn't read or prioritize. But if you pick the thing you're talking about, then you have to know it. Like you picked it. There's no excuse for me asking you questions about that topic and you saying, well, I don't know anything about it. But the second thing is it, it invites us to reconsider what we mean by expertise. So one of my fields of study in academia was philosophy. And if there's anything I know about people who study philosophy, it's that the best philosophers are really brilliant on one, two, or three areas of specialization, but then there are wide areas of their field that they can't even answer questions about. So for instance, I know political philosophers who can talk all day long saying all sorts of brilliant things about the nature of the state or democracy, but then if you ask them questions about philosophy of religion, they maybe can't really tell you much about the ontological argument for the existence of God. Or there are philosophers who know a lot about ethics or moral psychology, but if you ask them to go in depth talking about David Hume's problem of induction or skeptical concerns raised by Rene Descartes about epistemology, well, they're kind of lost. And so even when you talk to experts, you'll find that there are a variety of fields that experts can't even answer about their own question, about their own uh, area of study, but they're experts not because they can answer random questions about their subject. They're experts because they're the most brilliant people in the world on about one or two subjects. What do you think about that concept? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think it's, I think it's so important because it doesn't really matter what you don't know. I mean, when you watch TV and you see somebody brought on as an expert on something, you're interested in what they're there to talk about. I mean, if, uh, you know, I don't know, try to think of a, a popular example. If you get, um, you know, Mike Rowe to come on a TV show to talk about jobs that people aren't interested in taking, you wouldn't want to see Mike Rowe come on and be asked about, uh, you know, the way that penalties are called in hockey, right? You'd be, and if he didn't know anything about it, you'd be like, well, this is so irrelevant. He's prepared to talk about what he wants to talk about, and we judge him based on that. Like, it doesn't really matter all this stuff that you may or may not know that some other person values, but what do you value and what do you know about? That's, that's not cheating. When I say, hey, you tell me that you're really interested in X, let's go talk about it uh, publicly on a podcast or on television, the pressure's on. I mean, think about from our participants' standpoint. If they say, oh, man, I'm really passionate about philosophy. I know quite a bit. I want to learn a little bit more. I'm going to dive into some of the stuff you guys have provided, some other stuff. I want to help you guide me through while I learn. And, like, I know my stuff. We say, great. You know it well enough to go on, on live and talk about it? Uh, then it's like, whoa, okay, I really got to know. Do I really know that? How much do I know? What am I comfortable talking about? And sticking with those things that you're passionate about and that you want to learn about and that you do know about, that's so much more valuable. I mean, why would you waste time being grilled on stuff that's not interesting to you? Um, and again, you, you, you know, you can't fake it. You can't fake that knowledge. And why would you want to? Because now if somebody says, hey, your interview was awesome. You seem like you really know your stuff when it comes to cryptocurrency. Why don't you come work for me? You're like, if you were faking it the whole time, right, that's, that's a bad position to be in. So, um, I think, it's just, I think it's just an amazing way to, again, you know, one of the things in higher ed, the cost is going up and everything because everyone's buying that credential and only the people who have the official, official accreditation, they're the gatekeepers, they have a monopoly on that credential. So they can spit out whatever they want to and call it a credential and the value is declining. So rather than responding with, we need new gatekeepers, we need new metrics for measuring knowledge, we need, you know, different people standing at the gates. No, man, we need to smash the gates. We need to be the educational equivalent of the blockchain, of Yelp. Let's provide a platform where people can judge each other, where it's a peer-to-peer -peer trustless system, where you demonstrate your value, you demonstrate your knowledge for the world to see open. You tear off those doors and let it happen out in the open. Let us all see the process. There's a reason teachers say, show me your work, because they want to know if you understand how it works or if you just memorize the multiplication tables that's what we're doing. Show me your work. We'll take it to another level. Show me the way that you discuss and process these ideas. You know, we have some recent evidence of this working. So a few weeks ago, an employer contacted me because they were considering one of our Praxis participants. And they had all sorts of questions about this person, about their work ethic and, and different sorts of things. And based on their questions and their concerns, I said, okay, look, 
we have a record of exams, oral exams this person has taken. We've got video footage of it. And you know, I, I put together clips of, of a, a few oral exams, sent it to this employer. They got back to me right away and said, this was so much, use, so much more useful to them than anything I told them about the participant. And it was more useful to them than their own interview because they had the chance to see that participant demonstrate knowledge and skill in a context that wasn't, you know, that was outside of, let me try to impress the employer and tell them what they want to hear, you know? Yes, I remember that because it was somebody who, hey, the resume is great, the interview is great, but like this person's really young, I, I, everything I see says that they should be good, but I, I want to kind of verify that and coming to us and saying, what do you think of them? And we say, we think they're great, but don't take our word for it. Watch them in action. And I, I remember that. I, I think I was CC'd on that email uh, and the participant got the job. It was a great job. I said, man, this, it's right. This person really knows their stuff. You know, this participant is awesome. These oral exams are really valuable. I mean, that to me is what it's, what it's all about. Like, go ahead and take a look and you be the judge. You give them a grade. Don't trust ours. You know, another thing about this is it teaches participants to learn and demonstrate competence in a way that's actually mirrored by, by real world activity and in a way that's relevant to the process of creating results that they care about in, in real life. So uh, for instance, with our, our writing projects, what we do is we don't say, hey, send us a paper on a topic you care about. We're gonna give you a grade and then give that back to you so you can throw that away like you do for the papers you write in high school or college. We say, no, identify a blog you like to publish on. Identify a magazine or a website or a journal that you'd like to be published in. Write something that you think has a shot or something you care about. We'll, we'll have a professional editor give you feedback and constructive criticism. You get a chance to rewrite it, and your assignment is to submit that for publication because the world shouldn't place their faith in us. We don't care about Isaac Morehouse saying, you're a good writer or this paper deserves an A. It's much more powerful when you can point to a respected blog or magazine and say, say to someone, hey, I'm published here. And if you want to know about my writing, go read something that I wrote. Or with the oral exams, you know, one of the reasons why we do, do it this way, like podcast style, is because when in the real world, apart from being arrested and interrogated by the police, are you ever going to demonstrate knowledge by having someone drill you with a bunch of questions to see if you're lying to them about doing your homework or see if you're telling the truth about a book that you read? In the real world, you demonstrate knowledge by creating results with what you know or by talking about it in a way that's educative or entertaining. And so we try to mirror that process in the way we do our exams. Oh, man. I mean, and this is all about breaking down the barriers between work and play, between learning and doing, between the world of education and the world of work, all these artificial barriers and, and walls put around these different segments. Smash them all. It's all one big thing. You got to be a learning person all the time. And that, it, 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 you know, that ties in bringing in knowledge as well as doing things with that knowledge, demonstrating it, doing things in the world. It also involves entertainment and fun. How many people, when you're interviewing for a job, they're looking for not only that you know your stuff, not that you're just like, yes, the way to manage a cash flow statement is the following. They also want to see passion and interest. They, they kind of want to be entertained. They want to have a good time. When you listen to a podcast, you don't just want someone who's knowledgeable, but someone who makes you excited about the subject matter. Whether or not you think that's a fair assessment of knowledge, that's what's valuable in the world. And so putting it out there in a public format, not only are you showing the world what you know, you, you better make it fun and interesting and entertaining as well. You know, we want to see that you love the ideas and that you can make us think in new ways and, and, and really enjoy the process. I, I love that analogy you use. There's nowhere in the real world, except for if you're arrested, uh, where some authority figure grills you on factual statements and says, give me all the correct responses. In the real world, it's a give and take. It's conversational. And if you're boring, even if you know your stuff, you probably won't get the opportunity. If you're entertaining and you know your stuff, you probably will. So those things are just as important. And that's something that really doesn't get assessed or measured in the educational system at all. Absolutely. One of the things we like to talk about is this expectation that a degree or a certificate or a professional license is going to do all of the heavy lifting for you. That if you just jump through the right hoops, do what you're told, follow the right instructions, listen to the right people, you'll eventually get some sort of piece of paper that will 
allow you to have a life. And one of the things we try to teach is the thing that's going to result in you getting a life or you getting anything that you want in the world is your ability to create value and your ability to, sig to signal to others that capacity to create value. And everything that we do is oriented around that. So when you take an exam with Praxis or you do an exam with Praxis, this is not about impressing an authority figure. This is about you taking advantage of an opportunity to show the world that you can create value. And it's not about what can this credential view, uh, do for you. It's about what can I, the, the test taker, do for the world and how can I show the world my ability to do that? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, this is, this is so simple. I mean, this is really what Praxis set out to do originally to create a better way to signal not just what somebody says you can do, but like show the value you've actually created. But this small tweak, because originally our oral exams were not public, this small tweak of making it real time publicly available to the world is the thing that breaks it wide open and it removes all the trust in us as an institution. Well, Praxis seems pretty good. They've sent us good people in the past. They say this person's excellent. I guess I'll trust them. And says, no, man, you take a look and you see. And it also removes the the pressure on the participants to do what they think Praxis will say is good and to say, I want to do what I think is good. I want to show you that this is interesting to me and I want to demonstrate my knowledge on this. And, and we're there to provide structure and feedback on the learning process. We have an amazing curated list of content in a lot of different topics that we think are going to be valuable to the participants and valuable to the market. But those are all open and adaptable and flexible. You know, if you find something that's different or you want to work on that, it's, it's all there. We're really just the platform to make it easier for you to show the world what you're capable of and to be your own credential. You know, one, one more point about all of this. I know you and I are big fans of liberal arts. And in the debate about disruptive education, it's usually presented as if it's liberal arts or entrepreneurship. And we believe in both. We believe that a, a good liberal arts education can help make you a better entrepreneur. There's and, and, an entrepreneur out there who can't pick up a, a book about some philosophical idea and understand it. You know, I mean, if you're not a good thinker, you're not going to be a good entrepreneur, right? So you've got to have some of that, but it depends on how you're, who's defining it. Absolutely. And, and so when people talk about liberal arts, what they usually say is liberal arts is it helps people learn how to think critically. Like this is the value of liberal arts. But I think what a lot of people leave out is they focus too much on content rather than context. That critical thinking isn't just what happen, what you learn by studying the right sorts of materials. It's also what you learn by the approach you take to studying those materials. There's one philosophy professor I, I had who said critical thinking isn't taught, it's caught. It's learned by doing the right kinds of activities. And so one of the things we do is we not only give participants options to study things that help them learn how to think critically based on content, but we also take an approach to that that challenges them to think critically. So they have to make decisions about the things they will study. Like we will not decide for them what all of those things will be. We provide a pre-existing structure for them and we say a certain amount of time on this or on this or on that, but within that, there's this range of options and you have to choose. And critical thinking is, is developed as a result of that because you have to ask yourself, well, hmm, how do I want to signal value to the world? What's most interesting to me? What aspects of philosophy or history are most relevant to the things I want to create? And I think that's something that's, that's left out all too often as well, you know? Oh, man, absolutely. I mean, given that window, hey, here's this window of time uh, a month down the road where we're going to have your, your oral exam. Um, here's a bunch of material and some different things and interactivity that we're going to provide. But, hey, it's up to you. Uh, spend a month largely self-guided with, with our help in whatever ways you want it. Your, your month of, of self-directed learning on X is going to be followed by an interview about X where you demonstrate it. And what that does is not only what you learn, it's learning how to manage your time. If you want to be an entrepreneur or heck, even if you want to be in sales or even if you just want a job where you don't have a boss telling you every little detail of what to do, the hardest skill, the hardest skill you will ever have to learn is how to pick and choose where to spend your time. When I did fundraising, there's an infinite number of people I could go after and pursue to try to raise money from. Some have a lot of money and very little knowledge of who we were. Some had a little bit of money, but a lot of knowledge. Which one's more valuable? The person that I have a 50% chance of getting them to donate $10,000 or the person that I have a 1% chance of getting a million from? 
I don't know. Nobody knows. You have to decide. As an entrepreneur, there's a million things that you could be pursuing at any given time. And learning how to self-prioritize and come up with your own system and techniques is probably more valuable than the things you're going to learn themselves. And at the end of the day, it's that market test. Talk about it. How, what was your process like? That's great. But what was the result of that process? What do you know? Let's see it. Absolutely, man. I love it. It's exciting working with you, man. And constantly playing around with new ways to improve this process of empowering people to educate themselves. It's, it's the greatest privilege in the world. I can't overstate what a breakthrough this was for me, just this notion of, of democratizing the credentialing process. Because we've been so close to it from the get-go with practice. Mm -hmm. And that's really what we've wanted to do. And we just haven't quite figured it out. And really this analogy to me of, of Bitcoin, of the blockchain, of of crowdsourced stuff, the democratization of so many things, realizing that it's not about being a better gatekeeper that's more accountable to the market. It's about tearing off the gates altogether and letting the market be the credentialing mechanism. And to me, like be your own credential, get graded by those you want to be graded by, not those who say I'm a I'm a expert and I've received accreditation from some bureaucracy. Like Let's just open this thing wide yeah. up. I think it's a massive breakthrough, uh, such a subtle twist, but I think it's world changing. We got to give a lot of credit to the invisible hand as well, man. There's been a lot of uh, spontaneous order in this process because it's not like we don't have access to or connections with people in academia who've been sitting in on the exams, conducting them with us. So this isn't some sort of ad hoc uh, method we're employing because you know we, we can't get professors to do these exams. We, we've had a lot of reputable professors do the grading with us, do the exams with us, but all yeah, along we- a huge improvement over the traditional yeah. credentialing process, the oral exams as they are, but this next step of just opening it up to the world, I mean, that's the one that blows the doors off. A absolutely, and I, I have to give a lot of thanks to business partners or employers who have been seeking out our participants, asking questions that sort of help lead to these kinds of discoveries. This isn't just based on something you and I came up with uh, according to our own personal concepts of, of what's cool, but by listening to the people out there that are doing the hiring and, and hearing their requests, because they're our customers too. Like, what are you looking for in an employer? If we're training, in an employee, if we're training people to think entrepreneurially and to take charge of their professional lives, we have to pay attention to the people out there who are investing their money. Yeah, what yeah. do you look to to verify that this person is there? And, and our participants as well, the constant feedback. I remember you telling me about a participant recently who you said, hey, look, if you want to get really knowledgeable on a particular thing and focus on that instead of, you know, whatever the standard uh, stuff is in, in a given module, you can do that. And she asked you, she said, okay, well, if I pick something that's sort of non-standard that I'm passionate about, um, who will do my oral exam? How will you grade me? Will you have to become an expert on that in order to do it? And at the time, you were kind of stumped. You're like, well, we'll figure that out. You know, maybe I'll read up on it and then be able to certify whether you're really knowledgeable on this thing. Maybe I'll find an expert. And she was, she was hitting on something. Like, who do you want to, to know that, you're val that you have a lot of knowledge on this? Who would you pick to be the judge? It's the people you want to work with. It's the people you want to raise money from or start a business with. You want them to say, hey, she knows what she's talking about. And that's what we're doing. We're not going to go out and select the best oral examiners. We're going to let you select who you want. You send them the clip. Here's me talking about this. Tell me if you think I have enough knowledge. And if I do, let's work together. I mean, it's, it's been this give and take, this feedback process uh, from day one. Absolutely. That, that's something that I love most about the curriculum experience. It's not just this sort of static list of resources that experts have chosen. It definitely involves that. We have a lot of content that's been curated by brilliant professors and entrepreneurs, but it's not just the list of things you study. It's, it's a dynamic, multi-dimensional experience that's constantly evolving in response to feedback we're getting from the marketplace, whether that be from our participants, from potential investors, from um, employers, and so forth. So it's, it's a really cool thing, and, and I think we're giving the world uh, a model for what private education can really do um, you know, when you give people options. Absolutely. Couldn't be more excited. Let's, let's go shake things up. Let's do it.